see y'all this morning. Good morning to everybody here and also to those that are joining us online. I'm really excited. I'm like on cloud nine this morning. Um, just want to say good morning and hello to our missional family that is literally at our house right now preparing 500 meals to be delivered to the homeless population in Dallas-Fort Worth, and I'm fired up about that. Um, I also want to say good morning to my brother in the Middle East. You know where you are, who you are. We love you. We're praying for you. And we'll see you soon. <laughs> Praise God. Uh, would you guys pray with me? Lord, we thank you so much for your word, for your spirit, uh, for family, for church family and the freedom to come together to worship you openly, to be able to serve you by serving others and the joy that comes with that all. Oh God, we thank you so much for all of that. And I pray, Lord, that in this moment, this, this time, that we don't forget about the sufferings or the struggles that we have, God, but that we bring them to your feet because you are big enough, you are God enough to handle them all. And so, Lord, penetrate our minds and our hearts with your word, by your spirit. Let us be encouraged, convicted. Let us be emboldened. Lord, allow us to see you like never before this morning. And I ask, Lord, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be acceptable in your sight. For, Lord, you're my rock and my redeemer. Amen. You know I love you, right? For anybody that's visiting with us. That's just something that we say here when there's going to be a word that may be a little uncomfortable. Because sometimes in order to grow, we have to hear things that are uncomfortable. And we, we want that, right? We, we want to be stretched, to be pruned. We want the things of God, the things that are not of God to be removed. We want to grow in our faith. And so I want to preface, before we even dive into the Word, I just want you to know that I love you so much that I'm going to give you truth this morning. And some of it may be a little bit uncomfortable. So, so let me say this. I have, I have an encouragement. I have a challenge. And I have a question. The encouragement... For my Christian brothers and sisters in this room and online that are all in for Jesus, that are giving him everything you have, that are fighting in the army of the Lord, that are on your face day and night praying for the lost, praying for the young in Christ, praying for those that are suffering. For my Christian brothers and sisters that are sharing the gospel and discipling others and giving your time, your money, and all of your resources for the cause of Christ, and yet you find yourself discouraged because you look at the world and then you look at the church and it feels like it's turning into a business and, and you find yourself heartbroken, discouraged, and you want to throw your hands up and quit. To you... I want to encourage you to keep fighting the good fight. I want to encourage you not to quit. In the words of Paul, I want you to not grow weary in doing good. I want you to know that your labor is not in vain. Don't give up. God is working. That's, that's the encouragement to you who are all in and radical for the cause of Christ. Don't give up. Don't quit. Not now. My challenge to the lukewarm, namby, pamby, self-serving, self-indulgent Christians that has no desire for holiness, no desire for godliness, no desire for service to the Lord, that has no desire to get in His Word, no desire to pray, that doesn't pray for courage 
and boldness because you're not doing anything that would require his help. To the Christian that thinks the Christian journey is just to show up at church and let somebody pour into you, but you're unwilling to pour into anyone else. To the Christian that hasn't introduced anybody to Jesus in years and is still living off the experience from 20 years ago. To the Christian that is not making disciples, that has no desire to, making, to make disciples, and is just sitting, ha sitting back being fat and happy. I want to lovingly, I want to graciously, yet boldly challenge you to get off the bench and get in the game. I want to ask you, I want to challenge you to realize that you have the privilege and the opportunity to be in the army of the Lord, and I don't want you to waste it. I want to lovingly push you. I want to lovingly push you to desire Christ more than anything else for yourself, your family, and the lost. And I want to ask you to get uncomfortable and to step out on faith and to trust the God that you say you believe in. To the unbeliever, just a question. Who else would you trust in? And, and to any unbelievers that are listening online or maybe some of you in this room hasn't truly committed to Christ, let me apologize to you on behalf of Christians because I think that maybe in your wrestling with Jesus and whether or not you want to follow him on one side, you've seen the dogmatic rule follower Christian that's legalistic. You can't do this. You can't do that. No love for people. No love for God. Just following rules. And on the other hand, you've seen this looseness, this freedom in Christ that allows you to sin and do whatever you want that, that, does, that looks just like the world. And so you're confused I'm going to show you through Jesus' words today what a follower of Christ looks like and what's required. But my question to you, unbeliever, is who are you going to put your faith in? You cannot save yourself. Neither can I or no one else in this room. Only Jesus can. I say all of those things because today we're going to be talking about leading people to follow Jesus. Last week, Harani did a phenomenal job of describing what leadership looks like, the responsibilities of a leader. Next week, Logan is going to talk about everyday life and what it looks like to lead people to Jesus in everyday life, the, what that picture is. But today, as we, as we come to this subject of leading people to follow Jesus, I, there's something that has to come before that. And, and, and this is what I would say. You can't lead someone to follow a person that you're not following yourself. And so I'm going to do something very dangerous today. I'm, I'm going to quote Jesus, and it's probably going to get me in trouble. But I think that's the safest bet for me. And the best thing for you is to tell you what Jesus says about following him and what Jesus says about leading people to follow him. And it's, it's interesting. I was thinking about this, and as the Lord was writing this sermon, I had the privilege and the opportunity to have dinner with the Barkers. And we had an amazing meal. Like I lost weight on the fast, and I think I may have gained it all back when I went over there. But as we were sitting and talking, they were sharing with me their travels around the world. And our daughters began to tell me the story about a flight, a flight attendant and what the flight attendant does. And everybody that's been on a plane is familiar with what they say when you get on a plane. They show you the exit rows. They welcome you on the plane. They talk about the pilot. You hear the ding, ding. They do all the talking. And then they tell you in case of emergency or cabin pressure drops... They said, the mask will come from the ceiling. And do you remember what they tell you to do? They said, first, 
put the mask on yourself so that you then can help put the mask on your children or somebody else. That's the picture of following Jesus. First, we want to make sure that we're following him. And once we know that we are, we want to lead people to follow him. This isn't just a call from one life. This is a command from Jesus himself. And so I want to show you in Scripture. Go with me to Matthew chapter 4. And we're going to have, we're going to go through quite a few texts. The majority of them will be on the screen. But Matthew chapter 4, we're going to start in verse 18. I always want... I always want us to either take out our phone or take out our Bibles because Ronnie led us months ago through the series on habits. And what better habit to have than to be in the Word of God and become familiar with it? So Matthew chapter 4, verse 18. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Jesus says, follow me. Those two words we're going to see throughout Scripture. Follow me. Now, when we come to a text, any text in the Bible will always tell you we have to put ourselves in their shoes, right? Because we have to account for the differences in Scripture and the differences with us. When it comes to Scripture, it looks different depending on who he's talking to. And so we have to account for that. So Jesus is telling Peter, he's saying, I want you to follow me. But remember, this is Jesus physically in the flesh saying to Peter, I want you to follow me physically. We're going to go from city to city, town to town. Now, obviously, we don't have Jesus physically here with us telling us to follow him, but he tells us to follow him nevertheless. Whenever we look at any scripture, we have to account for differences, and we have to find out what travels and what doesn't, okay? We see it all from from the very beginning. You go back when God created man in his image and and in his likeness in Genesis 1 and 26. The first command that God gave, he said, is to be fruitful and multiply, Multiply my image all over the earth. That's what I want you to do. And the way that that was done was by procreation. In other words, they're going to have lots of babies, making them in the image of God. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So when Jesus comes on the scene in the New Testament, the command doesn't change. It is still multiply my image all over the earth. But the way that we multiply is different from the way they did. Theirs was procreation. Ours is a spiritual multiplication. So what Jesus tells us to do in Matthew 28 is to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. So we share the gospel. God appropriates it in the heart. There's a new life. That is the multiplication that we do. So when we come to this text and Jesus is saying to them to follow him physically, he's saying to us to follow him spiritually, which plays out physically. Does that make sense? Y'all follow me? What does it look like and what is the cost to follow Jesus? This is what I want to show you through Scripture. And I want to give you his words. So let's go to Luke chapter 9. Verse 23. So what Jesus says in Luke chapter 9, verse 23. And he, said to, and he said to them all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So we see the follow me again, but Jesus says when it comes to following him, you got to deny yourself. This is the thing from the very beginning. This was introduction to people. Jesus says, deny yourself. Now, this isn't like the diet that we do from time to time to where we say, okay, I'm not going to eat sweets, but I'm going to eat everything else. Or I'm not going to eat bread, I'm going to eat everything else. This is not talking about denying yourself this or that. This is literally saying, I denounce and deny that I have control over my life. 
I give it all up to Jesus. Whatever Jesus says, I do. Whatever He says not to do, I don't do. Because Jesus is not just my Savior, He is my Lord. Those things come together. And what Jesus is saying is you have to deny your right to rule your life. I'm in charge now. This is the gospel. This is non-negotiable. This is what it looks like to follow Him. And then He goes a step further. He says... Take up your cross daily and follow me. My brother Shavaz did a great poem about Jesus pieces, and I love it because it shows the difference between what we think about a cross when we wear it on necklaces and shirts and all of that. They wouldn't have done that back then. One, because they weren't making T-shirts, but two, the cross is an instrument of torture. And Jesus is saying, I want you to take up your cross daily and follow me. What does that mean? What does that look like? That means when you follow Jesus, there's going to be rejection. We're not talking about there might be rejection. Do you remember what the world did to him? We put him on a cross, beaten, battered, abused, the worst torture in the, in the history of man. And we killed him. And Jesus is saying, if you follow me, you're going to have rejection. And here's the deal. We're not just talking about rejection outside the church. This is also rejection inside the church. Because going to church and being religious is not being a Christ follower. Submitting yourself to his authority, his will, and his way is being a Christ follower. You hear words inside of the church, people saying, Bible thumper. Are you going to be a Bible thumper? And all of a sudden, that's turned into a bad thing. Jesus is looking for people that are going to thump the Bible because when you thump the Bible, you see what holiness is about. You see what godliness is about. You see what it looks like to follow Jesus. Thumping the Bible lets me know what's my thoughts or what's Jesus' thoughts because he will never tell me to do something that's not in his word or that's contrary to his word. So yes, Jesus is looking for Bible thumpers. You hear Jesus freaks. I want to be a Jesus freaks. If, if that means that I'm submitting everything I have to God, that I'm intentional about following him, that I'm completely dependent upon him, call, sign me up. I'm a Jesus freak. You talk about holy rollers and holier than thou. You hear these words in the church meant to be derogatory, but Jesus calls us to be holier than thou. I'm supposed to be set apart. I'm supposed to be a peculiar people. I'm supposed to be different. Good God Almighty, I wish we had some people that were willing to lay it all on the line and say, God, I'm all in for you. Amen. Call me what you want, but call me lined up with Jesus. This is what it looks like to follow him. This is true Christianity. And Jesus is calling us to this. He's saying this is what it looks like to follow him. Never said it was going to be easy. And that's why for any unbelievers in this room or any unbelievers that may be watching online, Jesus said, count the cost. I want you to know what you're signing up for. I, I, I want you to see this. Go with me to Luke chapter 9, verse 57. And I want to just briefly paint this picture of what it looks like to follow Jesus. And, and in this text, you're going to see some people try and make excuses. These men want to make excuses, but Jesus doesn't lower his standard. And I'm not talking about perfection. I hate that I even have to qualify this statement. Obviously, our perfection is found in Jesus. If it weren't, what would we need Jesus for? Our perfection is found in him, but that doesn't mean that we don't strive for holiness. And I, I want you to see this. Luke chapter 9, verse 57. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. This man says, I will follow you wherever you go. 
And it's almost as if Jesus is trying to talk him out of following him. Jesus says, I want you to understand. You commit to me. You follow me. I don't have a house. I don't have a bed. And, and, and the implication that he's saying is that I don't have these things because this is not my home. I'm just passing through. Brothers and sisters, I want you to understand that this is not our home. We're just passing through. But the picture that Jesus is painting here, he's saying following him is not going to be easy and it's not going to be comfortable. So let me be the first to say to you, if that's what you're looking for, you don't need to follow Jesus. Because he may very well send you to the dirty places. He, he may very well tell you one life that I don't want you going to Applebee's or Olive Garden today. I want you going down to Faith Mission and speaking life to the hurting people. He may tell you one life that I want you to take the money you got and go to Haiti and build an orphanage. Things that are not easy and not comfortable and not safe. He may tell you one life, I want you to go to Middle East, to the Middle East. Because there's a house church there that needs encouragement and needs support. And I know your wife is scared. And I know she's worried. But Jesus says, go, and you got to go, sweets, i got to go. He may send you to the rough places. And if you aren't willing to follow him there, then you don't follow him at all. This isn't a halfway in between one foot in the door, one foot out of it. Either you're all in or you're out. I heard a guy give this analogy. He says, a married man wouldn't give 95% of his time to his wife and 5% to another woman. We would say that that is preposterous. So why do you do it with the God of the universe? Jesus says that is unacceptable. He says to this man, you follow me, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be comfortable, but the reward is great. Next two guys, verse 59, to another he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. The next guy, but as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Jesus is telling this man, all he, just think about this for a moment. All he wants to do is go and bury his father. And Jesus is telling him, there's, there's an issue that's more pressing than you even having a funeral. Now, understand, understand the context here for this Jewish funeral. This could have been days of mourning um, and, and, and all of the things that they went through for this process could have been like a year-long process. So basically what this man was saying is, Jesus, I love you. I want to follow you wherever you go, but uh, I'll do it next year. Can we be honest with ourselves and see ourselves in these statements? How we try and put it off, how we try and procrastinate. I, I, I want us to see ourselves. This next guy in verse 61, yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at home. Jesus said to him, no one puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Listen, let's be, can we just be honest? I'm not talking about being honest with God. He already knows our hearts. I'm talking about being honest with ourselves. We want to soften these verses. And we want to say, well, he didn't really mean what he said. Or, well, he would never say that to me. If in your mind now you are saying that God would never say that to you, you are exactly the person that he would say it to. 
The picture in these last two guys is that following Jesus takes priority over everything. Wait, did Brian just say everything? Because I'm married and I got, I got kids and, and, and I knew you would think that. And so I, I don't want to tell you my thoughts once again. Let's go to another text and I want to tell you what Jesus says. Luke 14, verse 25. And we're just going to look at a few more. Luke 14, verse 25. Listen to this. Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and he said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. You don't see that on t-shirts and coffee cups, do you? Jesus is literally saying to the people that are wanting to follow him, in comparison to your love for your family and your own self, compared to your love for me, the love for your family looks like hate. Because I am supreme over everything. This is the gospel, brothers and sisters. This is what it looks like to follow Jesus. These are not my thoughts. These are the God of the universes. These are his words. In this room right now, online listening right now, there are all kind of questions going through our head. One, some of us are trying to figure out, do I take the challenge? Do I take the encouragement or do I ask the question? Some of us in this room are trying to figure out, am I the brother or sister that's all in that he was talking to? Am I the brother or sister that's lukewarm that he was talking to? Or am I the unbeliever that needs to ask the question? And here's the deal, only you and God know the answer to that. Some of us are listening to these words and are saying, oh my goodness, he is being harsh and this is hard. But remember what I said from the beginning, I love you. And I have to give you truth. But I want to show you, I'm going to take you to one more text because I want to show you how we aren't any different from the disciples that he, were, he was talking to back then. Let me just ask this question, and I want you guys to be honest with me. Are these hard sayings? Anybody think these are hard sayings? These are hard. One more place, John chapter 6, verse 60. I want you to listen to this. Because Jesus has been saying these things. He's talking to the crowds, to the disciples, those that are wanting to follow him. And then he sums all of them. And, and I want you to hear this. Am I hot? Can you all hear me? I want you to hear this. This is important. John chapter 6, verse 60. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, and said to them, do you take offense at this? Just, just pause there for a minute. Don't, don't raise your hand, but do, is something in you maybe taking offense to the words that I've read so far? What Jesus demands, be honest. Verse 62, then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I've spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. Now listen to this, verse 66. After this, Many disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. I want to finish reading this text, but I want you to understand this. Everything that I've said to you, it's not optional. These, the words that Jesus has spoke these aren't things to where you say, well, I might pick that one or I might pick that one. No. 
you don't follow Jesus like that, you aren't following Jesus. That's a very bold statement that I just made. But this is fact. No, this isn't fact. This is gospel. And Jesus said these things to the people back then. And it wasn't the thing that the things that would make them feel comfortable. And it wasn't the things that would make them feel good about themselves and make them think that they had it all together. No, it wasn't those things, but it was the things that would give them eternal life. But a lot of them turned and walked away. You have that option. You can say, I don't want to be a part of that. Here's the deal. If I can just go off on a tangent for a minute. Ronnie is leading us in a... In, he is leading us in a way to where there's not room for people that are sitting on the bench. And we are moving in a way to where it's all or nothing for Jesus. And we desperately want everyone to be a part of that. But we all have a decision to make. Are we going to be consumers, sit back, get fat and happy? Or are we going to walk out our calling in the, army of the God, uh, in the army of God? Some of these people walked away. And listen to what Jesus says in verse 67. So Jesus said to the twelve, Do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord... To whom shall we go? Ruth, we talked about this last Sunday. Peter says, you have the words of eternal life. And what I want you to see, church, is that if anybody decides to walk away, there's no one to walk to. Nobody can do what Jesus does. Nobody can take you to God like he can. There aren't any other options. It is to live or to die. It is to be with him or without him. And we have a choice. In the words of Joshua, choose ye this day who you will serve. And I pray to God that we choose Jesus. And now that we see what it looks like to follow Jesus. Now that we see in his word what that looks like, I want you to know that everything Jesus just said is only the beginning. Like that's just the beginning. That part was between you and God. Go back to Matthew 4. This is the last one that we turn to, I promise. Jesus said, he, he saw the two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me. But he didn't stop there. Listen to the next part. And I will make you fishers of men. In other words, now that you're on the team, now that we're a part of the family, you have a job and there's responsibility for you. You're not just going to sit back and eat for free. There's work for you to do. I want you to go out and share with everybody what I've shared with you. I want you to be ambassadors of Christ to the world. I want the world for myself. And here's the deal, church. Jesus said, if you don't stand up and praise me, if you don't stand up and worship me, I'll raise up the rocks that will give me glory. This is the gospel. This is the word of Jesus. This is the command of Jesus. To sit back on the bench is not optional. He says, go therefore. Therefore, in light of everything that I've said, I want you to take it. I want you to go. I want you to make disciples. I want you to teach them all the things I've taught you. I want you to baptize them because I want all the glory, all the worship, all the praise from everyone that I've created. And one life, I'm giving you the privilege of being a part of that. As the band comes back up, there's this song that they've been working on. And it's called Simplicity. And it's talking about getting back to our first love. But at the exact same time, it's talking about getting rid of the distractions 
getting rid of those things that take our attention away from Jesus and trusting in him 100%. Listen, I know the things that I said was hard. The thought of walking up to someone in the grocery store or being intentional in a conversation, looking for a way to, to share Jesus is terrifying. It's scary. And it takes courage. It takes boldness. It takes compassion. It takes love. Most importantly, it takes the Spirit of God. Here's the thing. If you're a follower of Jesus... You have that spirit in you. When it comes to discipling people, being on the front lines, being in the mess, walking through broken marriages, walking through kids that are just being completely disobedient, broken homes, all of these types of things, people that love the Lord, want to get closer to the Lord, it's messy. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes a long time, but it's worth it. It's worth it for God to get the glory, and it's worth it for them. People in this room have been praying for my father. I want to be careful to honor my daddy, but I want to share with you that he is an extremely hard man. 43 years old, and I remember two times that he's told me that he loves me. One was when I preached my first sermon in Arkansas. Second was one of my trips coming back from Afghanistan when I got an award and he realized the things that I'd been through and seen over there. And I've shared with you, my family, about my desire for God to change his heart. And I know that there are people that have prayed for him, that have sought God for him. And my daddy may not be there yet, but he called me last night at 5.05, and he said, son, I'm sitting in the smokehouse out back. And your mama gone and your brother not here. And I'm looking out and I'm seeing the rain. And I just wanted to call and tell you that I'm proud of you. And my mind goes to Romans 1 when God says, everyone knows that I'm God because I've re revealed myself by the things that I've created. I said, is it possible, is it possible that as he's watching the rain fall, that God is tenderizing his heart and that the seeds that have been planted by others are beginning to grow and that someday soon God may give my daddy a new heart. We don't know what God will do with our unusual acts of kindness, with our, with our words that we use to share with people about Jesus. Clint Sisson once told me one time, he said that God will take our little bit and multiply it. So I just want to ask you this. Will you take the little bit that you have, the little bit of boldness, the little bit of courage, the little bit of knowledge of the word or a lot, how, whatever you have, and will you be intentional about going all in for Jesus? This is my plea, and this is his command. Leading people to follow Jesus in everyday life is not just a call, but a command and a privilege. And I pray that as this church, we would all be all in for that. I'm not going to close us out in prayer. 
as the band plays. We're going to be up front. Josh will be in the back. If you're burdened for the things that I've said, if you're nervous, anxious, but you want to be all in, you want to step out, whether that's support role or on the front lines, but you're nervous and scared, would you allow us to pray with you? It doesn't matter if we're here to 3, 4 o'clock. Would you allow us to pray with you for courage and strength and the Spirit of God to lead you? This is our prayer for our church, for you.